Welcome to my home on the water's edge near Hobart in Tasmania. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about The Beautiful Mother, my new novel that's just out, and also just introduce you to me, because this book is set in Tanzania, which is the country where I was born. My father was a safari doctor and my mother was an artist, and we had an adventurous childhood, often going on safari with, with Dad, where he would operate a medical clinic from the back of his Land Rover. My mother would be under a tree painting, and us kids would just have an, a, a great time playing, and the only regulation was try not to get yourselves eaten by a crocodile or bitten by a snake at some point during the day. But that childhood had a lasting impression on me, uh, it wasn't all fun and games. We saw people suffering from terrible illnesses and we understood that um, mothers uh, in particular really suffered from, from not always being able to keep their children safe and give them everything that, that, would, that, that they needed. And that was something that, that has always stayed with me and has been part of the reason why I wanted to tell the story of the beautiful mother. The Beautiful Mother is the sixth of my novels that have been set in East Africa around the independence era of the 60s and 70s, and this one is set actually in the year 1970. It's set on the remote camp where a family of archaeologists are searching for the origins of the human species, and in particular trying to show that Africa was the home of all of us. Essie is my main character. And uh, the story kicks off when she, as a young woman, uh, is out in the field one day. A chance encounter results in her coming home holding a baby in her arms that she's to care for during the rest of the dry season before returning it to the hunter-gatherer family into whom that baby was born. And the mother has died, leaving the little one with little chance of survival without help from Essie. Essie does not want this new job of being a mother. It's, it, she's a career woman. She's actually a workaholic. They all are. And uh, her mother-in-law, her husband, no one's going to be happy about this. And so I'm just throwing a massive uh, amount of change into that little world that I create there in the researchers' camp at Lake Magadi. She's not going to be giving to this baby so much as the baby's going to be transforming her and offering her a new way of seeing the world. Just about everything changes for her. Her rational, organised sense of how things are, it's all going to be thrown up into the air. It's even going to push her back into her own history and her connection with her mother, who was uh, born in Tasmania but lived her life in other places. Where did it all begin for me? Well, it began quite a long time ago now with the birth of my two babies, my two boys who are now young men. But I remember how being pregnant and childbirth and then later being a mother really brought me back to my instinctive self. Uh, you, you knew that you were an animal when you're giving birth, that's for sure. Um, but then afterwards too, that baby was so helpless and you knew there was a lioness inside you that would rear up to defend that little one if need be. And these emotions to me were quite alien and, and began me wondering about how we evolved and why. I mean, why is the human baby so helpless for so long? Why is childbirth so incredibly painful and difficult? And the answer, of course, lies in our evolutionary story. It's to do with the fact that we stopped being apes and stood up on our hind legs and began the journey towards being human. With setting this story in the context of the search for human origins and having the interaction with the Hadza people who are in fact some of the most ancient people with the oldest culture on earth, I realised in the end I'd be telling a very intimate story about one woman, woman's relationship with a baby and herself and her mother, who's now dead, and her family, but it would be on this very big stage of the human journey. I was always interested, actually, in the Leakey family, who, who really are the inspiration for my family of archaeologists. They worked in the area of Aldervai Gorge ever since the 30s and right up until now. And many of you, like me, may have come across their story in the pages of National Geographic. 
Because I was interested in them, 10 years ago on one of my research trips back to Tanzania, I went to Olduvai Gorge along with my brother, we were travelling together, and visited their camp and saw, um, got, got some glimpses of the kind of work they'd been doing and the landscape. And that's where I was going back to with this book. Another thing that was happening too uh, in the inspiration for this was a television series called The Human Journey that my husband, um, the filmmaker Roger Scholes, had made uh, again a long time ago now. Our house remained full of props from this program that he made. Here's, here's the Neanderthal skull. It's not real, of course, because if it was, it would be 300,000 years old and probably not in such good condition. But you can see that brow ridge and some of the other features that show that this is not Homo sapien. We've also had these things in our house ever since then. And this is a, a, a genuine Acheulean tool. These are made, they, they sit so beautifully in your hand. And these are made by Neanderthals. And this actual object here is probably 300,000 years old. So we all actually got involved in that film production and my younger son played a part in it and I played a part in it and all of us became very familiar in the story of the human journey. Something else happened on that trip to Olduvai Gorge or just afterwards which was that my brother and I along with my parents we went to visit an orphanage run by a friend of ours. Now, it was a very uh, special kind of orphanage. It was not for giving children away to other families. It was uh, only for babies whose mothers had died in, died in childbirth. And these much-loved babies were to be looked after for just the first couple of years of their life and then returned to their families. And uh, interestingly, a teenage girl from the family accompanied them for that entire two years so they had someone to bond with. You can imagine how complicated that is for the, the orphanage director, teenagers and toddlers. Um, but that left me with this sort of interesting idea about that really fragile time in a human's life where they need so much mothering and what happens when, when that mother's no longer there. So I became interested in the idea of temporary motherhood. I wondered what kind of revolution could take place in a woman's life just over a few months of uh, taking on that new role. Now, this baby in my story is not just any baby. You know, it's, it's a Hadza baby. It's the child of the last hunter-gatherer tribe uh, in East Africa. Now, we all were hunter-gatherers for 99% of our human journey, which is a pretty amazing thought. Nearly everything about us, all those things about being a mother that I spoke about, the male and female characteristics that we have, they all originated or evolved, I should say, during a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and to meet the challenges or the requirements of that way of living. They are the most fascinating people, They're the Hudson. They're completely egalitarian. They own almost nothing except the few hunting things that they've got. If they lose them, they just make more. They share everything, raise their children equally between everybody who's around. They don't store food. They certainly don't hoard food, as we've all been tempted to do lately. They can just trust the planet. It, it provides for their every need. And of course, that's something we can barely even imagine now. And yet it's, 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 um, it's perhaps a vision that we would like to return to in some way. Through her contact, my main character, Essie, through her contact with the Hadza people, through baby Mara and her assistant, Simon, who has been, who, who was born a Hadza, but who has uh, given his heritage away, at least at the beginning of the book, we really start to pick up some of these lessons of, of ancient wisdom that I think are really relevant to us now. And one of them is to do with respect for the land. And this story is set in the foothills of Aldonia Lengai, uh, which I also visited, uh, one of the most amazing places I've been on the planet. And this is the holy mountain of God and the place where Lengai lives. In the novel, there ends up being a uh, conflict, as so often happens, between the objectives of the, the archaeologists and their quest for academic knowledge 
and the need to respect land and that comes to, to a big uh, crisis in the book. When I wrote this story, I had climate change in my mind as, as a threat to the, to the way of living that we, that we now have. Um, this, of course, for the moment has been overtaken by this, this terrible um, coronavirus that's, that's threatening us and making our worlds feel so fragile. So this is a really good time to look at a story like The Beautiful Mother, which touches on deeper, different, more ancient ways of relating to each other to ourselves and to the land on which we live. One of the abiding things that came to me in researching the story of our species was that we are so resilient. We only ever became who we are because of climate change and that's why Africa and that part of East Africa, that's why that was our home because climate change was happening so quickly that lakes were appearing and disappearing and landscapes were changing within living memory and it required a lot of thinking and adapting and that led to physical changes all through that incredible process of evolution which involves mutation, chance mutations that happen to favour one person over another and their survival means that they're the ones whose genes go on and it's just such an interesting um, it's just such an interesting thing to delve into and I had a wonderful time writing this book. I loved going back into my experiences of being with a baby and the intimacy of bath times and the touch of baby skin on yours and the feel of a baby nestling against your your neck. You know, I just I reveled in all of that and I hope you will too. Um, and then to set that against this big story of, of this the progression of humans and how we have always been able to rise to the challenge. And so I just leave that with you today with, with where we are now. I hope that if you read this book, it will be an escape for you. It'll take you away to a faraway place, to other people's lives and other people's challenges. And then I hope that you'll return to the here and now with, with some of that hope that uh, really is there in this story. Thank you.